Okay. بسم الله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ثم ما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. So إن شاء الله تعالى today I'll be sharing with you an, an overview and hopefully through this overview you and I get to know a little bit better some things about Surah Ali Imran the third profound surah of the Quran. As far as the merits and narrations of the surah are concerned, I shared some of those with you. They're shared between Baqarah and Ali Imran, how both of them come together as clouds on judgment day or flocks of birds protecting or making a case on behalf of the one who accompanied them. And the word sahib is important to mention that someone who stayed, spent a long, long time pondering and reflecting over the meanings of these profound surahs. So Ali Imran is quite long and it has many, many sections. But if you were to take a bird's eye view and kind of try to understand what the surah is about, it's about a handful of things. And one of the words that really describes and you know and summarizes the essence of this surah is choice. This new Muslim nation has been chosen and Allah has given them profound responsibility. This messenger has been chosen with profound responsibility and he has chosen to give the final revelation to this messenger والسلام, and with that choice comes a great burden, a great sense of responsibility. So this surah actually literally picks off from where, Ali, where Baqarah ends. In Baqarah, we asked Allah not to put a burden upon us more than we can bear. Now that we are a newly formed nation, Ummatan Wasata in Surah Al-Baqarah. In Ali Imran, that idea of choice is taken further. Of course, on the one hand, it's choice, but on the other hand, there's also a profound amount of hope that has been granted inside of the surah. Early on in the surah, Allah starts a, a long discourse with the people of the book. Uh, especially some narrators mentioned this is in the context of a group of Christians that came to meet with the Prophet ﷺ and were wanting to see what this claim is, that this man is claiming to be a prophet. We want to know what this is about. And these were people of religion. They stayed in the Prophet's mosque and they continued their ritual worship as Christians while they engaged in conversation with the Prophet ﷺ. Um, and so that's one of the subject matters that you'll find the people of the book being told, this is the final testimony. This is the final revelation from Allah. You need to accept this because it confirms what you people have. And so Allah takes them back to the story of Isa alayhi salam and retells the story. He tells them the story even of Yaqub and how the law was mixed with some of his own personal preferences. كُلُّ الطَّعَامِ كَانَ حِلًّا لِبَنِي إِسْرَائِيلِ إِلَّا مَا حَرَّمَ إِسْرَائِيلُ عَلَى نَفْسِهِ مِنْ قَبْلِ أَنْ تُنَزَّلَ التَّورَاتِ He starts questioning how they, you know, all kinds of food was permissible for Israel. For meaning Israel meaning Jacob, that's his other name. Except for what he made impermissible upon himself, you know, before the Torah was even revealed. So bring that, and Torah was given to Musa alayhi salam. So how can they say the Torah says that what Jacob wants is impermissible? I mean, that's even generations later. So the, the Allah says, فَأْتُوا Torah, فَتْلُوهَا إِنْ كُنْتُمْ صَادِقِينَ Bring the Torah, let's look at your evidence from the Torah itself. So Allah is actually questioning the way in which they engage with their own revelation. Because if their approach to their own revelation would have been correct and, and properly laid out, they would have arrived at the conclusion that the Qur'an is in fact the final revelation. So instead of criticizing or saying, leave your revelation, come to the Qur'an, Allah is saying, actually engage your own revelation as you should and you will arrive at this conclusion. That's how they're told to come to this now you know, final choice of Allah in Nadina and Allah al Islam. One of the most profound, interesting thematic shifts you'll notice between this surah and the previous surah, Surah Al Baqarah, is that Baqarah mentioned many matters having to do with spirituality and the heart. So from the very beginning, fi qulubihim maradun, Allah mentions they, their hearts have a disease, talking about the hypocrites. Thumma qasat qulubuhum, their hearts became hard. Allah will talk about iman, faith, la riba fihi, there's no doubt in it, that, that's a matter of the heart. So the heart and Spirituality is actually a very recurring theme in Surah Al-Baqarah. And you can sum, sum that up as Iman. Iman. On the other hand, in Surah Al-Imran, you'll find the word Islam come up over and over and over again. So it's almost as though how Iman and Islam go with each other. Islam being the outward manifestation of the faith, Iman being the inwardly. It's That's the complementary role they play with each other. You can't just have faith on, in your heart and not demonstrate it on the outside. Islam is talked about. That's why the word Islam keeps coming up in this surah over and over and over again. So that's the first theme about choice. The second theme is the clashes intensifying. Now that this ummah has been chosen, congratulations, you are now the ummah that represents the truth of God to all of humanity. Uh, our, our clashes with the disbelievers also intensified. What I didn't say in my introduction to Baqarah, because there wasn't any, you know, I don't want to go into too far depth, but it's good to contextualize now. In Baqarah, Allah actually commented, mentally prepared us for the first coming battle, uh, which is the battle of Badr. So there are, there's revelation inside Surah Al-Baqarah that was given to mentally prepare Muslims to deal with what is coming against the Quraysh. And it's really interesting that in Baqarah, what Allah did was He narrated the story of David and Goliath, Talut and Jalut. Um, 
and and you know Dawood and Jalut even. Uh, why? Because that was also small group taking on a large group, just like the Muslims are going to be a small group in Medina taking on the large group of Quraysh. So this battle of the Muslims and the Quraysh was actually made a, babble, a, a battle of biblical proportions. It was compared to the biblical account of David and Goliath. Right? And this was important because in Medina you have Christians and Jews. And when they see this is being compared to David and Goliath, they're going to go back to their own books and they're going to read that account again and say, wow, you know, these people stood for one God and they stood against idol worshippers and pagans. And now these people, these because they assumed all the Arabs are the same, they're all pagan. Then why are they fighting among each other? And they never fought about religion. You know, the Arabs never fought about religion. They fought about other things. They fought about land, resources, somebody slapped my sheep, I don't know. They fought about other silly things, but they didn't fight about religion. Why are they fighting about a religion? And on top of that, this one group is at odds with everybody else because they believe in one God. This echoes the previous clash of David and Goliath and all the other clashes that they have in their books. So actually what the Qur'an does is it exhaustively describes in this surah, not pre-battle commentary, that was Baqarah, in Ali Imran, he actually gives post-battle commentary. Now the Muslims have faced a terrible loss at Uhud. The tables have been turned. Seventy of the greatest companions of the Prophet ﷺ, including his uncle, have been mercilessly slaughtered. And, at, and, and the Muslims had to literally escape up a mountain. When you were climbing up the mountain, not even turning back, looking at anybody. That's the scene painted in this surah. And then the Muslims are told, now how do you hold on to your faith? It's easy to hold on to your faith, you know, before the fact. You've been pumped with hope. This has happened before. God's aid is going to come. All right, we're going to be able to handle it. On the other side, what about when you suffer horrible losses? Why did, if we're the people of God, if we're the people who believe, if we're alladhina amanu, how come we lost? And so Allah will explain that with profound wisdom in this surah. How are Muslims supposed to deal with victory? And more importantly, how are they supposed to deal with loss? How are they supposed to deal with loss? An exhaustive, exhaustive camp commentary. And that also, it resonates with the people of the book that these people don't lose faith. Why, why are they, you know, either, either they're winning on the battlefield or they're losing on the battlefield, but they hold on to their faith. And then of course, Finally, in this surah, you find this, this merger. It's a strange merger. SubhanAllah, the way Allah does it. He talked to the disbeliever. He told the Muslims, the believers, أَنْتُمُ in كُنْتُمْ مُؤْمِنِينَ You're going to be superior, supreme. You're going to win in the end if you hold on to your faith. Just have faith and even the powerful armies of Quraysh are going to be nothing you'll be able to deal with them. On the other hand, there was this ideological conversation with the Jewish and Christian communities, predominantly the Christian group that came to met with the Prophet ﷺ. And that's more an ideological clash, not a physical clash. But by the end, the groups among these that are stubborn in their ways are merged together and they're just called الَّذِينَ kafaru, those who have disbelieved. In other words, the Qur'an's you know, depiction of those who've truly disbelieved is a depiction of people who after knowing the truth inside and out reject it. And Allah does not want to make sweeping comments about all the people of the book. So what does He do in this surah? وَإِنَّ مِنْ أَهْلِ الْكِتَابِ You know, مَنْ إِنْ تَأْمَنْهُ بِدِينَارٍ You know, لَا يُؤَدِّهِ إِلَيْكَ it is among the people of the book, there's one, if you, if you give them a single buck, they won't give it back to you. But others, بِقِنْطَارِ يُؤَدِّهِ إِلَيْكَ You give them a pile of wealth, they'll give it back to you. They're trustworthy. And Allah will give good qualities of some of the people of the book who pray, who have taqwa, who compete in يُسَادِعُونَ فِي الْخَيْرَاتِ وَأُولَيْكَ مِنَ الصَّالِحِينَ وَمَا يَفْعَلُوا مِنْ خَيْرٍ فَلَنْ يُكْفَرُوهُ وَاللَّهُ عَلِيمٌ بِالْمُتَّقِينَ uh, Amazing words, you know. They're, they're from among good people and whatever they do won't be taken away from them. Like the Prophet said, خَيْرُكُمْ فِي الْجَاهِلِيَةِ خَيْرُكُمْ فِي الْإِسْلَامِ The best of you in, in the days of ignorance are the best of you in Islam. Allah doesn't dismiss their good deeds in the surah. So He doesn't let us make sweeping comments. And as you conclude, when you, when you get to the end of this amazing, amazing surah, what a journey this surah is really. Like when Muslims are in, in tough times, this is the surah to recite, I would say. It's the surah to recite. Especially the commentary, the dedicated ayat to what happened at Uhud is absolutely remarkable. You know? Uh, one of my favorite places in the Quran, الَّذِينَ اسْتَجَابُوا لِلَّهِ وَالرَّسُولِ مِنْ بَعْدِ مَا أَصَابَهُمُ الْقَرْحِ Qarh in Arabic is a word for injury. But when an injury cuts you so deep it reaches the bone, that's when it's called qarh. Like a deep gash. Allah says those who responded to Allah and the Messenger even after a deep gash injury had hit them. 
And what does that mean? The Muslims are demoralized. They're like the Prophet ﷺ had bled already. There was even a rumor that he's been killed. There are several companions that are lying there dead on the battlefield. We're running up the mountain and the Quraysh are talking trash, praising their false gods at the bottom of the hill as they see the Muslims running for their lives. We are completely a mess. We're a wreck. And now the Quraysh have left. And we finally get to breathe, okay, the enemy's gone. And then the rumor comes that they're making, they're coming around for round two. They're figuring, we made a mistake, we let the Muslims breathe, we should kill them off while they stand. And the Prophet says, we don't wait for them to come to us, we'll go to them. Imagine, these are all injured companions. They're bleeding and demoralized. And he says, we're going to go meet them, we're not going to wait for them to come to us. And they got up limping anyway. And Allah commented on their courage. Allah commented on their resolve. That they got up no matter what, you know. And so people who could do show me that kind of resilience, Ajrun Azim and Fanqalabu bi ni'mati min Allahi wa Fadlillam Yam Sasum Su. They came back with the blessing of Allah, no harm touched them. Actually, the Quraysh heard that the Muslims are coming back, they ran off. <laughs> they ran off. Even though the Muslims were in no real position to fight, this was a favor of Allah on them, a test of their faith. So we our faith is going to be tested. And that's why this surah also has th those ayat where when Muslims are downtrodden, how they have to l just really hold on to their faith and understand تِلْكَ الْأَيَّامُ نُدَاوِلُهَا بَيْنَ النَّاسِ These are days we flip up and down between people. لِيَعْلَمَ اللَّهُ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَيَتَّخِذَ مِنْكُمْ شُهَدَى So Allah could know who really believes. It's easy to root for the winning team. That's easy. How do you stay, you know, even in sports, you have the guy like, you know, the, his team is down 40 points in a basketball game, there's one minute left, he's still waving the finger, like he's a believer. That's faith. That's conviction. And that's the conviction Allah wants from this ummah, that we remain optimistic. And so by the end of the surah, one of the most profound spiritual prayers that are in the entire Qur'an, it, it actually it becomes the twin to the prayer at the end of Baqarah. And this was a, a great incident in the life of the Prophet ﷺ. So beautiful, in the middle of the night, he was sleeping, and he asked his wife, our mother, Aisha, permission. If you give permission, my master is calling me. He asked the wife permission before he got out of bed. And he gets out of bed and he starts praying and he starts reciting. And she, no she notices, she's watching him pray. She notices he started crying and his beard got soaked. And he went into rukur and a puddle started forming because his tears were falling. When he went into sajda, there was his entire, the, the place was literally a puddle where he was making sajda. And he wouldn't get up from sajda. He just stayed in there until it was fajr time. And the companions were gathered to pray. And the Prophet's not coming out of the apartment, not out of his quarters. And Bilal came to get him. Like, Ya Rasulullah, Fajr time is running out. And then he got up and he said, how can you call me when Allah has given me these ayat? And those ayat belong to Ali Imran. Where Allah describes the journey of a person's faith. These are ayahs 190 to 195 towards the end of Ali Imran. So in the beginning we're told, we're chosen. The, the people of the book were told, you were chosen, now this is the right choice. And by the end, how does someone arrive at that choice? That's the beauty of the, the, the conclusion of the surah, 190 to 195. And then thereafter, now that you have this journey to faith, لا يغرنك تقلب الذين كفروا في البلاد مطاع قليل Don't let the, what the disbelievers are doing, their activities, their schemes against you, don't let that stuff bother you. That's all little little bit of resources here and there. That's nothing compared to what God's resources are, what Allah's resources are. So once again, a surah of profound, profound hope. And the, I believe the more we develop a relationship with this surah, the more your sense of identity as a Muslim gets stronger. The word Islam keeps coming up in this surah. I can tell you, when I was studying this surah, one thing you could walk away from when you study this surah is you're proud to be a Muslim. Your, your sense of like, you're not ashamed to be a Muslim. You don't feel weak as a Muslim. You feel empowered as a Muslim. And that's one of the great benefits that comes out of Surah Al-Imran. May Allah Azza wa Jal make us committed to this profound surah and make it easy for all of us to even memorize it and ponder over it. Barakallahu li wa lakum. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.